Dear everyone, a warm welcome to Mark's book talk, um, The Extraordinary Life of Hu Xi. Um, this is Mark's, uh, the book that Mark's going to discuss today is his latest publication, and the title is um, uh, China's, China's Great Liberal of the 20th Century, Hu Xi, a pioneer of modern Chinese language. Um, yes, I'm, I'm your moderator um, today. Um, Mark was born in London and educated in Oxford. He worked in Washington, D.C., Manchester, and Belfast before moving to Hong Kong in 1978. He lived and worked in Asia ever since. He knows this part of the world very well. Um, we eat in Cha Chan Tang, and our conversation are often patched by three languages, um, English, Mandarin, and Cantonese. Mark has no difficulty switching between languages, and he also speaks um, French and Japanese. Um, Mark started writing books in 2006. Um, he has completed 12 books so far. Seven of them have been translated into traditional Chinese, and three in simplified Chinese. Um, this title about Hu Xi uh, has a traditional Chinese version, and Mark's previous um, works include China's Russian Princess, The Silent Wife of Chang Qingguo, Ireland's Imperial Mandarin, How Sir Robert Hart Became the Most Influential Foreigner in Qin China, Frederick, The Life of My Missionary Grandfather in Manchuria, um, his publication doesn't confine to seminal figures in China in the late 19th and to mid 20th century. His first publication was about the world's biggest Buddhist foundation, Ziji. The title of the book um, is Ziji, Surfing with Passion. And he also has books about Hong Kong and Macau. For example, the book about Hong Kong is How South Asian Helped to Make Hong Kong. And the book about Macau, is about, uh, the title is Pioneers of Macau, the story of 14 Chinese who helped to make the city. So the breadth and depth of Mark's knowledge about this part of the world is remarkable. So welcome, Mark, and please share the extraordinary life of Hu Xi with us. <laughs> I must thank the Hong Kong Trade Development Council for inviting us to the book fair, as they've done for the past several years. And for an author in Hong Kong, especially during COVID, it is the best platform to present our work because they do a lot of promotion. And uh, my mobile has been bursting for the last two weeks as a result. I especially want to thank Zhou Tong of TDC, who's made all the arrangements for today, and also uh, Choi for moderating the session today. If you want to see all my books, please go to the joint publishing stall in the main hall. Um, just before we start with Dr. Husho, I'd like to mention the next book, which will be published by Earnshaw Books. Earnshaw Books. Now, this will be about my Irish autobiography. Earnshaw Books is the biggest independent producer of English titles in the Chinese world. It has many interesting books on China and Hong Kong, history and culture. So please have a look at the Earnshaw Books website. Thank you. Now, Dr. Hu was the most important Chinese intellectual of the 20th century. And I was very inspired by his life and his work. He was a professor, he was a public intellectual, he was a diplomat, and he was an individual with a remarkable love life. He wrote 44 books, so it's quite hard to cram them into one hour. So let's, let's try. Let's start now. Now, I think he's most famous in China as the pioneer of vernacular Chinese, Bai Huawen. And this was enormous change that happened that happened in China in the 1920s. Now, there were many people involved in this movement for reform, but I would say Dr. Hu was probably the most important one. 
And also he played a key role in the middle of World War II, and we'll come to that later in the talk. He was also a public intellectual in the broadest meaning of the term. He was actively involved in all kinds of social issues. And this left a mark on tens of thousands of Chinese people. Now, I would like you to see this picture right at the beginning. And this was taken when he was a student. And just make a note of his expression. You know, he is very um, curious, inquisitive. He's keen to talk to you. He wants to listen to you. And he's very optimistic about life. And when we come to the last photo, which was taken just before his death, you will see it's exactly the same expression. He maintained this throughout his life. Now, he was born uh, in 1891 in, in uh, Shanghai. His father was a high official of the Qing dynasty, and he was the first and only child of the third wife. So his mother was much younger than his father. And at the time, his father was uh, officially in Shanghai, and then he was sent to Taiwan. And this was just after the Treaty of Shimonoseki, under which the Qing Dynasty gave Taiwan to Japan. So he had the misfortune to be a Chinese government official in Taiwan at the moment that the Japanese military arrived to take over Taiwan. Well, as you know, the Taiwan people opposed the takeover. And there was military resistance, but of course the Japanese army was much more professional, so they couldn't stop the invasion. So Mr. Hu's father escaped from Taiwan, went to Xiamen, and then he died in Xiamen. So as a young boy, uh, Hu and his mother returned to the family home in, in Jixi in Anhui. So here's a photograph of the house where they lived, and you can visit it now. And they were a wealthy family, comfortable family. But as you can imagine, there were three wives, and there were children, and there were many relatives. So there was a lot of fighting in the family, mainly about money. And whose mother was the third wife? So she was the lowest ranking of the wives. So it was comfortable in a material sense, but I think it was not a particularly happy family. And who was very, very close to his mother. It was the mother who was the one that brought him up. His father was not there. Now, this is a photo of who and his wife. He was engaged to her when he was 12 years old. She was 13. She was a lady from a nearby village also from a wealthy, well-established family. And as you know, at that time, nearly all women in China were not educated, and they had bound feet. So, uh, whose wife could not read or write? And as I say, they were engaged to marry when he was 12 and she was 13. Now, whose mother was a very insightful lady? She realized that as long as her son remained in Anhui, his education would be quite limited because the only, only education available there, of course, was traditional classical education. So he, she said he must go to Shanghai to study. So this is a photograph uh, taken in Shanghai in the early 1900s when who went there. Now, he was a very uh, prodigious student. Uh, by the age of nine, he could read the Chinese uh, classics. And he was, this is what makes him such an interesting figure. He was steeped in the old China, in the classical China. And then he goes to Shanghai. And as you know, Shanghai was the most unusual city in China then. Most of it was under the control of the French, the British, and the Americans. And it had schools which were not available anywhere else in China. So in Shanghai, he attended three secondary schools. And he was able to study what we call a modern education. So he was able to study English, mathematics, poetry, ethics, topics that were not available if he'd stayed in, in Anhui. And he was particularly lucky because 
The third school he attended in Shanghai was a school set up by Chinese students who came back from Japan. They'd been studying in Japan. The Japanese government passed some regulations which they didn't like, so they decided to leave and they came to Shanghai and they set up a new school. So in this school, who was able to meet Chinese students who had studied abroad already and also who came from all over China, not just from Shanghai. So he was able to, 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 to meet people from North China, from South China, from Beijing, Guangzhou, and get a very wide knowledge about China, even at a young age. And we're now at the end of the Qing dynasty. As you know, it was a revolutionary period. So the students were <clears throat> extremely involved in social, political issues. And who threw himself into this? So he was uh, editor of the student magazine, and he wrote a lot of articles on social issues, uh, such as against foot binding for women and to promote equal education for women. And toward the end of his secondary education, one of his friends said to him, well, you should apply for one of these scholarships to go to America. Now, you know the Boxer Indemnity Fund? This was money that the, Americans, the American government had received uh, after the Boxer Rebellion, but they decided to give it back to China to fund American, uh, Chinese students to study in America. It was a very, very clever investment, and they got much more than their money's worth out of it. And Hu was a very good example, because he was very pro-American for his whole life. So Hu decided to apply, and he passed the exam. So he was one of 70 Chinese students who left China and went to study in the United States. So this is 1910. So he went to study in Cornell University in upstate New York. Now, who was so lucky to end up in Cornell? I think he didn't choose it. I think they were allocated by the US Department of Education. Why was Cornell such a good place for him? First of all, it's a lovely location. It's in a rural area. Secondly, they had many international students. They had Indians, they had Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos. So immediately he was able to meet a wide, a wide range of different nationalities. The third point was that it was one of the few American universities that admitted women. So he was also able to meet a large number of highly educated and highly literate American women, which most Americans were not able to do, and certainly, of course, Chinese wouldn't be able to do if they were in China. So it was a wonderful place for him to study. So he stayed in Cornell for five years. He started with agriculture because his family said, you've got to study something useful. Don't study history or art or philosophy, you know, useless subjects. But he was a very intellectual guy. He had no interest in agriculture, so he switched to philosophy, which he was very happy with. And in 1911, of course, we have the Xinhai Revolution in China. And everyone in America wants to know what it means, what's going to happen to China now. So he took upon himself to become an uh, expert. So he took classes in current affairs. He took classes in public speaking. And he became very adept at giving speeches to church groups, women's groups, societies in Cornell, and this was a very good way to improve his English and also to, to get accustomed to public speaking and to deal with Americans, how to relate to Americans. This was a very useful experience for him. So this is one of the most important people, maybe the most important person in whose, whose life. She's called Edith Clifford Williams. She was also a student at Cornell, an art student, and she was a most unusual lady because her father was a professor of geology at Cornell, and he was an extremely liberal man. So he said to Edith, you don't need to get married, you don't need to have children, you decide your career, 
It's entirely up to you. We respect whatever you're going to do. And at that time in, in America, such parents were very few. And her mother, of course, didn't have this opinion. Her mother was much more traditional, of course. Her mother wanted her to, you know, find a good husband, get married young, you know, find a husband with means, you know, have children. But the father was the more important influence. So who makes friends with Edith? And they become friends for 40 years. And they write more than 300 letters to each other. And by the grace of God, the 300 letters are all still in existence. So you can read them. And she opened the eyes of, of Mr. Who. Because she was an independent uh, American lady. She had views about everything. She thought men and women were equal. And, of course, who had never met anybody like that? Never met a Chinese woman like that. So they spent a lot of time with each other, and they became very close. Yes? I don't know that. So he stays in Cornell for five years. But by the fifth year, <laughs> he's so busy with his talks and his articles and his you know, involvement in non-academic things that his department, philosophy department, says, we're not going to give you the scholarship anymore. You're not spending your time learning Kant and Wittgenstein. So he decides that he's going to move to Columbia in, in, in New York City. And one of the reasons he wants to move to Columbia is that they have a teacher there called John Dewey. And John Dewey becomes also a life mentor for who? And Dewey is a teacher at Columbia, so he, he enrolls in Columbia, and then he can study under him. And Dewey was probably the leading American public intellectual of this era. Um, he was an exponent of what we call experimentalism, which I should really say is like scientific inquiry. Any problem should be addressed in a rational, scientific way. We analyze the problem. Where does it come from? How do we solve it? A very gradual but very scientific method. And who saw China as so backward in need of enormous reforms? And for who, this was the, the way that China should go about it, use this method. Who never agreed with isms? You know, Zhu Yi because he said they are too general and sweeping. We should be very precise and, and, and analytical about it. And a bit later in the story, uh, who invites Dewey to come to China? And Dewey spends two years and two months in China. He gives 200 public lectures in China, 140,000 copies of Dewey's lecture. Jewish uh, lectures and speeches are translated in Chinese and spread among the public. I mean, we cannot imagine such a thing, neither today nor before 1911. So that is the impact that who, that Dewey had on who, and he wanted to share this with the Chinese people. So he studies in Cornell for two years until 1917. Now, among the many debates that Hu had with his Chinese classmates is what to do about Chinese language. Now, as you know, written Chinese in those days was Wen Yen Wen, classical Chinese. And this was the language that had been established many centuries before and was still used in official documents. So if you wanted to become a civil servant in China, you had to master this Wen Yen Wen because when you wrote documents, you have to use it. But Wen Yan Wen had no relation to the language used by ordinary people. So more than 90% of the public could not read official documents. So for who and many of the liberal reformist students, this situation was completely intolerable. China was already so far behind Japan 
the European nations, the United States. How is it going to catch up? It cannot catch up if its population is illiterate. So after intense debates, who and others decided that they have to jettison classical Chinese, don't use it anymore. Vernacular Chinese, Bai Hua Wen, must become the standard written Chinese. Now, of course, you can imagine among Chinese intellectuals, there was fierce opposition to this idea, especially those who devoted years to learning Wen Yan Wen. And in the book, I compare it something to Latin. It's not exactly similar, but, you know, for many centuries, Latin was the lingua franca of the Euro educated class in Europe. And then, of course, Martin Luther decides that it's ridiculous that the, the Germans are given the Bible in Latin, all the services are in Latin, but many of them cannot understand it. So he translates the Bible into German. So that's when the, the same movement, the vernacular movement, begins in Europe. But in, in, in the case of China, it's even worse than that, because with, with, with Roman languages, you can read the, the letters, you can pronounce the letters. But of course, with Wen Yan Wen, if, if you don't know the, the characters, you can't read them. So the need for change was even more important. So I just uh, put in, this is a poem that, who actually wrote to his uh, American girlfriend, Edith. I mean, she couldn't read it, but the, I put this in because it's written in vernacular language. So who said, everything I write from now on will be in vernacular Chinese? Okay. So while he's still in Colombia, he writes a very long article about why vernacular, Bai Hua Wen, must replace classical Chinese. It's a long, very detailed article, very, very persuasive. And he publishes this in Xin Qingnian, New Youth. And this magazine was started by Chen Du Xiu, one of the founders of the Communist Party. And who is still in America? But this article is printed in China and it has an enormous impact on young Chinese and on Chinese intellectuals. So before who even returns to China, he's, he's very famous. And many people agree with him. So he spends seven years in the United States, and he has an extremely positive experience. Now, as you know, at that time, America had ex exclusion laws against Chinese people. So while Husher is in Columbia University having dinners and having picnics with teachers and, 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 and high-ranking people, the ordinary Chinese workers who are living in Chinatown, working in restaurants or building sites, they cannot bring their wives to, with them to America. They cannot bring other Chinese to work there. They are the butt of criticism and persecution by uh, Americans. So their experience in America is miserable. But who and the other students, they have the opposite experience. They are very well treated. And this is why for his whole life, who has a very positive image, a very positive feeling toward the United States. So in his life of 71 years, he spent 21 years in America. So he comes back to, 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 to China, and he's immediately given a job in Beijing University. And he's so fortunate, because the principal is Tsai Yun-Pei, and Tsai Yun-Pei's thinking is very similar to who? He had studied in Germany for four years. He also believed China was extremely backward and needed to make enormous reforms. So he wanted teachers who thought like himself. So he hired Chen Du Xiu and he hired Hu Shi. So Hu Shi is just 28 years old and he's got a salary of 280 yuan and he is able to, to, to lease a 17 room Hu Tong house and you know, a very wealthy standard of living. Now, there's someone else working at Beijing University at this time as a clerk, 
assistant in the library, and he earns eight yuan a month. So Husher is 280, and this man is eight yuan a month. Can you tell me who this one was? That's right. Now, as you know, Mao had a very thick, a very thick uh, Hunan accent. His personal hygiene was zero. <laughs> Never brushed his teeth. He did not dress particularly well. So, of course, the, the, the people at Beijing University, especially the more arrogant people, just regarded him with contempt. So one day he went to a lecture of Husher, but he didn't have student card, of course. He's just an assistant in the library. So he wasn't allowed to attend. So we think these experiences help to explain why after Mao takes power in 49, he is so vicious toward intellectuals and especially Hu Shi, as we will describe later. There was a uh, fierce campaign against Hu Shi in the 1950s. So, so he moves into Beijing Da Xue and he moves into this big house. Now, sorry, I, I missed one thing I should have said. The first thing he does when he comes back to China is he goes to Anhui for the wedding with Miss Jiang that we saw earlier. Now, remember, they got engaged when he was 12, right? And now he's 27, okay? So, so Miss Jiang is waiting for him for 15 years. So he goes to the house, he goes up to the second floor, he enters the bedroom, but she has closed the curtain around the bed. He cannot see her. So they see each other for the first time only on the wedding day. Okay? Now, Miss Jiang is a typical Chinese of that period, which is to say she was not educated, she couldn't read characters or write them, and really she has no idea what her husband is, is talking about and all these articles and speeches and so forth. I mean, it's so the two of them live the whole life actually in different universes, completely different universes. So anyway, she moves to the house in, uh, in, in Beijing University, uh, and he starts his life as a teacher of philosophy. He's a very popular teacher because he's approachable to the students. He writes his own material. He doesn't just use the existing material. And he's very socially active. He doesn't just teach in the classroom. He has a lot of activities outside the classroom. Let me give you one example. He invites from New York a lady called Margaret Sanger. S-A-N-G-E-R. Anybody tell me who she was? She was the world leader of family planning and contraception. She was already controversial in the United States. She had already been to prison in the United States for advocating family planning and contraception. But Husher believed she was, this idea was so important for Chinese women that he invited her to come to Beijing and she gave lectures and he interpreted for her and her, her opinions were published in the Chinese newspapers because who believed that this was one of the areas of Chinese life that demanded the greatest reform? Because Chinese women were not educated, they were very restricted in the kind of work they could do, and this was such an enormous waste of talent. So he wanted uh, Chinese people to hear what Margaret Sanger had to say and what they could learn from her. As I mentioned, he also invited uh, Thomas Dewey to come. He stays for two years and two months, 200 lectures. He invites Bertrand Russell, the English philosopher. He gives 63 lectures. He invites Ramindranath Tagore from India, the Nobel Prize Literature Laureate. And all this takes enormous organization, you know, to arrange for them to come. He has, they have to have Translators with him all the time. He must arrange where they go to give lectures, where they're going to stay. And it's not only who alone. His friends organize this. But this shows what he wants to do to spread new ideas among Chinese people. So 
his wife moves to Beijing and they have three children. So they have two sons and one daughter. And the daughter, unfortunately, gets TB. So she dies. I think she's just four, four years old. Yeah. Now, when the first son was born, um, this is the poem that uh, Hu wrote about him. And in the Chinese context of the time, it's really a revolutionary poem. Because this is the ideas that he picked up, you know, from Edith <laughs> Williams in Cornell, which is, you know, you don't have to have any children. It's up to you. There's no obligation to have a child. So it's pretty clear from this that he, he was more or less indifferent to having children. But, of course, his wife w wanted to have them. Because he thought that having children was like a, like a kind of binding. Because as soon as the child is born, they have obligations to their parents which they can never fulfill. You know, they must look after their parents right until the end. You know, so it's like a, a binding. So uh, it's sad to say he was not a good father to his children. So maybe this poem is telling us uh, how it's going to be. So as I say, he and his wife have very little to speak to each other. They live in completely different universes. So he has a very passionate affair with a, a Chinese lady quite similar to Edith Williams, very independent, very well educated. And the lady becomes pregnant. So he goes to ask his wife for a divorce. And this conversation takes place in the kitchen. So Mrs. Hu picks up a vegetable knife and says, OK, I will first kill our two sons. Then I'll kill myself, and then you can have your divorce then. So, okay, he backs off. So after that, he never asks his wife again for divorce. Now, he will also have lady friends, Chinese lady friends and American lady friends, but he accepts that she is his wife and will stay his wife. And in this respect, who is better than Chiang Kai-shek? Or Sun Yat-sen. They also had wives given to them by their families and decided later that they wanted to get rid of them. And as you know, they both married Sung sisters. And take the example of uh, Sun Yat-sen. He asked his wife for a divorce. His wife said, you can live with Sung Ching Ling. I, I don't care. You can do whatever you want with her. But don't divorce, because if you divorce, then I am no longer the wife of Sun Yat-sen. I, I lose all face, all status in society. Please, don't divorce me. That's what Mrs. Sun said. But unfortunately, Sung Ching Ling, as you know, she was the daughter of a, Catholic, of a Christian pastor, and Christianity only allows one wife. So she said, if you want to marry me, you have to divorce your first wife. So in the end, Sun did that. So Hu Shi didn't do that. So he kept his wife throughout his whole life. And um, I think a lot of it is because of respect for his mother. Because he and his mother were very close. His mother arranged the wedding. So if he divorced his wife, he would be insulting his mother, I think. So the 1920s is a very productive period for, for, for who? He writes many books, and this is one of them about the uh, history of Chinese philosophy. And he writes it using the methodology that he'd learned in America. So what we would describe as very modern, very, very clear, well explained. And this was an extremely popular book. Seven editions were published. Um, now, 1921, as you know, was the founding of the Chinese Communist Party in Shanghai. And two of whose colleagues, this is Chen Duxiu, Li Dajiao, were founder members. And they invited Hu to join. But he 
didn't wish to join, and he always remained very against communism because he knew what was going on in the Soviet Union. And as I mentioned concerning uh, Professor Dewey, he thought communism, well, in fact, all isms, fascism or any kind of ism, they were too, too vague, too general, too sweeping, and they didn't address specific issues. So he, he never joined any political party, and he never changed his opposition to, to communism. Uh, so he wrote books, he gave speeches, he published many articles, he was very active in society. So here we are in 1931, what's happening here? Yes, so this is Japanese invasion of Manchugo, and Chiang Kai-shek, the president, has great respect for, for Hu Shi, and he very much wants him to be involved in the government in somehow. So he starts to arrange meetings with, with uh, Dr. Hu. And I want to bring to your attention the content of one of their conversations. Once Japan had occupied Manzhuguo, its army starts to occupy other parts of North China, and the, 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 the call among the public is that Chiang Kai-shek must fight against the Japanese. So President Jiang explains to Hu, this is the military reality. You, you can see the figures here, the, the Japanese army, the Japanese air force, the Chinese national army, the Chinese air force. If there is a war between China and Japan, China will be completely defeated. All its men will be killed, all its planes will be shot down. The only thing we can do is to, to temporize, make time, build up our forces, and at best invite Britain, France, United States, an external power to come and join the war on our side. So this was strategy of, of uh, President Chiang Kai-shek. And of course, for him, the real enemy is not Japanese. It's, it is, of course, the Communist Party within, within China. So he explains this very clearly to Hu, and Hu imme you know, immediately has a very good understanding of this is the Chinese government policy. And this policy, in fact, wins China five to six years of relative tranquility. So this is a, a rather propaganda picture of the two men. Actually, they had many disagreements and, and many, many arguments with each other. Um, as I say, Jiang greatly respected Hu Shi, but he thought he was an intellectual. He'd been in America for far too long. He didn't understand the reality of governing China. So a lot of his ideas about you know, a multi-party system and, uh, you know, and a diverse media and these kind of ideas were very appropriate for United States or European countries, but were not appropriate in China. So they, they continued to argue about that for the whole life. So here we are, 1935. China has been fighting Japan now for four years. And who, who has a much better understanding of global affairs than Chiang Kai-shek or most of the people in the government, is very pessimistic because he doesn't see any intervention by America or France or Britain or anyone else on the side of China. So this is the Japanese army invading uh, Beijing, 1937. And luckily, Mrs. Hu and the second son were able to get out just before, and they took 70 crates of documents, manuscripts, before the Japanese arrived. Okay. So President Chiang says to Hu Shi, look, Please, could you go to America and persuade the American government to join the war on our side? So, who doesn't really want to join the government? You know, because once you join the government, you become part of a system. You have to obey your superiors. 
So initially, he agrees to go to America to lobby, but not as part of the government. But later, he agrees to become ambassador. So 1938, he becomes the ROC ambassador in Washington. But who understands American politics very well? And as you know, the Americans at that time were very isolationist. Why had they gone to America? They'd gone to escape all the religious, nationalist, ethnic wars of Europe. They didn't want to be involved in wars in Europe or in Asia. The sentiment was very much against such involvement. 1940, we have presidential election, and both candidates, Republican and Democrat, both promised the electors that we will not join the war in Europe. Otherwise, they would not be re-elected. So Roosevelt wins the election, but he's still very much against joining the war. So who is becoming very despondent? He's very, very active. He gives hundreds of speeches at universities, think tanks. He writes articles in American newspapers. He has very good relations with leading officials of the American government, but he cannot persuade them that it's in American interest to, to, to join the war in Asia. Now, as you know, the US and Japan at this time have quite a few points of conflict. You know, America stops provision of oil and soybean. And the Japanese Imperial War Cabinet decides that they have no alternative but to start a war with America. So the fleet leaves Yokohama bound for Pearl Harbor. But in Washington, in Washington, the Japanese ambassador and his staff are busily drawing up an agreement with America that would stop the war. It would be an agreement, a peace agreement. So they draw up the agreement. The British agree to it. The Dutch agree to it. The Australians agree to it. All that is needed is Mr. Roosevelt's signature. Okay? The fleet is already halfway across the Pacific now. The orders are, if the agreement is signed, they go back. No attack on Pearl Harbor. So, who demands a meeting with Roosevelt, goes in to see him. Now remember, who is from Anhui, and he's small. You know, Roosevelt is a big, is a big guy. Roosevelt is one of the most powerful people in the world. Who is representing what is a weak country at that time? But for the first time in his life, who loses his temper? He says to Roosevelt, you cannot sign this agreement because there's nothing in the agreement about Japan pulling its forces out of China or leaving Manchuria. It just deals with US-Japanese relations. Now, Roosevelt's national interest is to sign the agreement because that would mean no more with Japan. But who knows Roosevelt well enough, and he's very persuasive that Roosevelt is persuaded by him and doesn't sign. He doesn't sign, so the fleet continues its journey towards Pearl Harbor. Now, Taita and I lived in Japan, and we met some Japanese scholars there who told me that the US military intelligence had cracked the Japanese military intelligence and knew the attack on Pearl Harbor was imminent. They knew two days before. They showed this intelligence to, to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt put it in his uh, drawer and locked the drawer. So he knew the attack was coming, and he did nothing. So the attack happens, and of course the attack completely changes the American public opinion, because they see it as an unprovoked attack on American ships and, and sailors and facilities. And this was the result, this famous speech to Congress, you know, the day that will live in infamy. So America enters the war. And the man who organized the attack on Pearl Harbor is called Admiral Yamamoto. And he had spent time in the embassy in Washington. 
He had traveled all over America. He had seen the aircraft factories, the artillery factories, the car factories, the tank factories. So in his diary on the night of December the 8th, 1941, Yamamoto wrote, we have lost the war. It's day two of the war. They've just launched this amazing attack on Pearl Harbor. They sunk all these American ships. And he says, we have lost the war. Because he knew that Japan cannot possibly defeat the United States because of its industrial power. So we call this chapter Saving China. I mean, that's rather exaggeration, but I like to see what who did on that meeting with Roosevelt as one of these key moments which helped China to win uh, World War II. So the next year, 1942, who leaves the post of uh, ambassador? He's very relieved. He doesn't want to be an official anymore. Now, he could go back to China, but the situation in China, as you know, is very chaotic and uncertain. So he stays in New York, and he lives uh, there for four years. He writing, speaking, and... and uh, he has many friends there. So the war ends, and he's invited back to, to China to be the head of Beijing University. So he comes back in 1946 and takes this position. But it's really the worst time to be the head of a university in China because the Civil War is in full swing. January 47, the American emissary Marshall has left. He's given up hope of negotiating an agreement between the two sides. There's very high inflation. The student campus is constantly in turmoil with demonstrations and protests. And who has many great plans to develop Beijing University into a, a, into a world-famous university? But he cannot get the staff, he cannot get the funding, and he cannot get the students even to stay in the classroom. So I show you this picture to show his state of mind at that time. You, you, you notice this is completely different from all the other images we have of him. You know, he's just feeling desperate. There's no hope. So in November 1948, the Communist Army is already surrounding Beijing. So President Jiang sends a plane and invites the prominent intellectuals of Beijing to take the plane and leave Beijing. So some of the intellectuals are very anti the government, so they decide to stay. But um, Hu is very clear. He has been to the Soviet Union. He has seen the situation there. So for him, there's no question. He has to leave. So he and his wife take the plane, but the second son they plead with him to leave, but he won't listen to them. He said, I have done nothing bad to the communists. They have nothing against me. Why should I leave? And Hu Shi says, well, yes, but you are the son of Hu Shi. It's not your fault, but you're the son of Hu Shi. So that is your identity. Therefore, you should leave, but he, he, he won't leave. So he and his wife fly to Nanjing and then Shanghai, and then he goes back to United States, and he never returns to mainland again. So here's a photo of him at this, this stage. Now, after the nationalist government moves to Taiwan, this is where Dr. Hu would like to be, because he still feels there's a lot he wants to do. But his wife refuses to, 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 to live there. And now, she, remember, stayed in China during the war, she stayed in, the, in Shanghai in the foreign concession. So between 38 and 46, she had not seen her husband before at all. So he couldn't reject her request this time. So she moves to New York. So they live there in New York. And uh, uh, he does writing, research, and so forth. But he goes to Taiwan quite often. He's very much involved in, in events in Taiwan, and he's always hoping that he can move there. And in 1953, we have the only meeting of Edith Williams, the, the girlfriend, and uh, Mrs. Hu. 
and they stay for one month in her house in, in Ithaca in New York. And um, I think there's a good film to be made of this month <laughs> meeting. Now, fortunately, the two ladies could not speak directly to each other. So who has to translate everything? And I think this is a great benefit, you know. Um, um, for example, if Edith had said, how could Doctor Who be married to someone like you for all these years, someone who's <laughs> illiterate and cannot understand what he's talking about? Uh, I think Doctor Who would translate that as, uh, you're a really exquisite cook, you know, <laughs> you made a wonderful <laughs> dinner for us. No, no, uh, no. Edith uh, Williams was a very cultivated lady, and she, no, I think she would not say such a thing, even if she thought it. And when they left, she presented uh, Mrs. Who with uh, uh, kitchen utensils with her name engraved with uh, the Chinese characters of her name. And I think this is a really remarkable gift. I mean, who in Ithaca would know the characters and be able to engrave them? Anyway, she found such a person. So I think the meeting passes off very well. I think that's what Doctor Who wanted. These, these two most important women in his life, it should be a, a peaceful, friendly meeting. Now, this is a magazine started in Taiwan by opponents of President Zhang. They were saying, we must have a multi-party system in Taiwan. We must have a free press in Taiwan. So this is the magazine they used to spread these ideas and uh, who contributed much to this. And President Zhang's answer was, well, I did that in the mainland. We allowed multi-party system. We had a free media. And what was the outcome? So I'm not going to make the same mistake here. So he was very much opposed to this. So he and who had many arguments uh, about this. So finally, 1958, Academia Sinica needs a new president. So they invite Hu Shi to come and, and take this position. So this is so prestigious that he decides that he, he will go despite his wife wanting to stay in New York. So he, he moves there, moves to Taipei, and he, has, uh, he enjoys it greatly. I mean, he knows many of the, the teachers and the, the, the academics who are working there. And this is another great contribution he made to China. Um, he realizes, how, how, I mean, how is Taiwan going to survive and to thrive in the future? It can't thrive by making, you know, badminton rackets and tennis shoes. It's got to make something better. So he proposes this National Council of Science Development. He becomes the first chairman. He gets the government to invest money. So today, as we know, Taiwan is an electronic uh, superpower. It's the world number one producer of semiconductors. So this all originated in this initiative of Dr. Hu. I mean, this had nothing really to do with him. I mean, he was uh, academic, he was a philosopher, he was in charge of, of academic research. But he was always trying to, 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 to give back to the society, to take part in the society. So that's what he, he, he did. So he has two heart attacks, his health is deteriorating. Now, this is the last photo we have of him and Miss Williams. Now, this is taken in New York airport. She sold the house in Ithaca. She's retired from her job, and she's moving to Barbados. So both of them know that this is the last time they will ever see each other. So I, I think it's such a wonderful photograph. Can you see the, the joy and the love from both of them? Now, in another world, they should have married. You know, if, 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 if Hu had not been married so early, to not engaged so early, then I'm sure he would have married her. But if he'd married her, probably he would have lived in America. And then we wouldn't be talking about him, and there would be no book about him. You know, he'd just become, an, you know, a successful Chinese-American. But anyway, this is such a, a, 
a wonderful photograph. And after he passed away, she sends all his letters to Academica Sinica in Taipei, and they give them to the Hushu Memorial Hall. So if you want to see them, uh, you can see them there. Now, her letters to him, they ended up in the Beijing University Li Library. Now, during the Cultural Revolution, as you know, the Red Guards destroyed almost anything of artistic or cultural value. They found the letters of uh, Mrs. Williams, but fortunately, they were in English. So the Red Guards couldn't understand them. So they, ju they just left them alone. So then, about 20 years later, a Chinese-American academic goes to Beijing University Library. He knew, he knew about the letters, but he didn't know if they still existed or not. So he asked the librarian, do you have the letters from her to him? And the man says, Dang Hua. And he goes, looks in the back, oh, here they are. So he hands the letters to the academic. So this American academic has written this wonderful book about both letters from both sides. So uh, I owe a great gratitude to this academic because he, <laughs> he's done the work and he's, <laughs> he's read the letters. So they're, they're, they're wonderful. So finally, Dr. Hu passes away at an annual meeting of Academica Sinica. And actually, this is the best way to go. I mean, he's surrounded by his friends and his colleagues. Um, he's telling jokes. Uh, he's chatting to them. And he has a heart attack, and he passes away. And he's put in the Elysium funeral home. And the Chinese uh, uh, writing is even better. Ji le, yi bing guan. Forty thousand people go to visit his body in this funeral home. Forty thousand. Remember, he's a he's a professor. He's a university professor. And then. They take the, the body down the street, and the streets of Taipei are th thronged with tens of thousands of people. So I find this is a very powerful symbol. This man was able to have such an enormous impact on society, on the country, on the thinking of people. So I, maybe I find this the most inspiring thing about him, that. He was an intellectual, but he, he did so much outside of the classroom, and he changed the country that he was in. So the Chinese which you are speaking, the Chinese which I studied in, in, in Taiwan, the Chinese which mainlanders study in, 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 in their schools, they are all, by often, the, the vernacular that he advocated. That is the extent of the impact he had. So this is final picture, and I just wanted you to remember the expression. It's just the same expression that we saw in the first picture. Do you remember? So this is, his health is poor. He's had heart attacks. He knows he hasn't got much longer to live. But he's the same optimistic, uh, happy, open expression that he had you know, when he was a student in, in, in America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for taking us back in time and summarizing the extraordinary stories of Wuxi in an hour. So um, now is the Q&A. Um, so uh, uh, you're welcome to ask uh, Mark questions. Um, you, the, since he speaks Chinese, Cantonese, and Mandarin as well. So we are welcome to ask questions in, in Mandarin and, and Cantonese as well. And of course, English. Uh, I noticed that uh, your second son stayed in mainland China. And uh, it was an extraordinary talk, and I really appreciated everything that you covered. 
However, I had a question about his second son that I, you mentioned he, he stayed in mainland China, and I noticed in the slide it said that he later on committed suicide. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what happened. Yeah, it, it was extremely tragic. It was extremely tragic because who sure knew what was going to happen? I mean, who sure knew what happened in the Soviet Union? He knew what Stalin had done to the intellectuals in the Soviet Union. He knew what would happen in, in the mainland. So he beseeched his son to leave. But the son was quite naive. The son was not a good student. Um, he didn't have good relations with his father. As I mentioned, who him criticized himself? He said, I'm not a good father. You know, he was so busy with all his other activities. You know, he didn't have a good relation with his wife either. So he didn't have a close relation with his son. So I, th I think the son was also uh, something rebellious, you know, my father wants me to go, I'm going to stay. But he really believed he was, uh, he was innocent. I mean, he wasn't, the son was not an intellectual or a, a threat to the government in any way. He was just not a playboy exactly, but rather idle. He ate a lot. He liked Beijing opera. And then in the 50s, Mao organized this anti-Hu campaign. It lasted for four years. There were eight volumes of essays criticizing Dr. Husher. So the son becomes a black person. No one will be friends with him. He cannot have any girlfriends. No, no girls will go out with him. So in the anti-rightist campaign, 1957, he cannot bear it any longer. So he, he hangs himself. Now, of course, this is not reported by the mainland newspapers. Who and his wife are in, in America this time, they don't know about this. They hear some rumors, you know. They don't get confirmation. So finally, in the 1980s, the son is rehabilitated. You know this term the communists use? Rehabilitated. It's sort of like an apology. But of course, it's, it's completely tragic and unnecessary, like thousands of such people at that time. Please, the lady behind, yes. Um, how did the Chinese Communist Party... Uh, the mic. Is not that that mic. Sorry. How, how does the Communist Party regard Hu Shi today? Was he also rehabilitated? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Yes, he is partly rehabilitated. So recently there have been some articles by mainland scholars and they praise his work on the Bai Hua Wen, on the vernacular. They praise his scholarly work, you know, on the history of philosophy, especially his literary criticism. I'm sorry I didn't get into this, but he, he wrote tens of thousands of characters of, you know, on, on literary criticism and discussing Chinese, Chinese classics. So the, the mainland academics very much um, praise his work there. But of course, they won't discuss his views on political reform or his, you know, his views against communism. Of course, they don't go into that. But no, the, 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 the um, verdict now is much more positive. But I asked my friends from mainland, and they say, unless you study uh, Chinese philosophy or Chinese literature in the university, you, you don't know about Hu Shi. I mean, he, he more or less doesn't exist. Only if you are in a faculty that would deal with him, then you, you would come across his work. But for the average Chinese, he wouldn't be mentioned. Which is very sad, I think. I think he's, a remark he's an inspiring figure. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, regarding your last uh, comment, I would say that actually his books these days are pretty popular in China. So on the um, on public uh, accessible like Chinese version of Kindle, uh, we can read a lot of books. And personally, I've read his autobiography at the age of forty. Um, and also, there were quite a few collections of his speeches and articles. So my question was: uh, uh, Is uh, can you describe a little bit more about your research process? You mentioned that he wrote forty-four books. Um, how many books did you read, and uh, are there any particular books uh, would you recommend by Hu Shi himself? Thank you. 
uh, I'm lucky to be joined by my distinguished colleague, uh, Chloe. So I invite her to answer this question. Okay. Um, I, well, <laughs> I believe, um, yes, um, Mark, um, well, my guess, after reading his book, um, and then from the, um, the conversations we had uh, before um, this book talk, I believe his uh, material is more than the 44 books that uh, Hu Xi um, wrote. Um, uh, yes, I, I believe his, his material, in, such as those letters, uh, and then um, all other materials, uh, archives, available in libraries, for example, in newspaper clippings, and then also his knowledge about China and Chinese history um, over that period of time and now. So I think his research method is pretty expensive, extensive and, and, and well over the books that uh, who has been written. Um, actually, talking about method, I also have a question. Um, regarding the method that um, um, you're doing for, for, for making this book. Because I would imagine that uh, quite a lot of materials that you use, or that you come across, um, they are in Chinese. So I, I would imagine that when you're writing this book, there's a lot of uh, translation um, you, have to do, you have to do. So, so in, in terms of translation, which part of translation work is most difficult or most challenging for you? Well, when I started this project, a Chinese friend said to me, Hu Shi is the most researched Chinese intellectual in history. You know, more people have written about him than anybody else. So, and that's quite correct. So I found some remarkable Chinese scholars there's one man in Indiana, he's a Taiwanese scholar, he's been in Indiana for 30 years. He has written three volumes, each about 600 pages, extremely detailed, and many others also. So, um, I have to stress, my book is a very short book, it's simple, it's aimed for the general reader, but I'm like a, you know, a primary school student compared to these Chinese scholars. Of course, nothing I write can compare with anything with, with what they have written. So, yes, I, I read as much as I could of th these works, but for, for the purpose of my book, because, of course, they have so much detail and they have so much textual criticism of, of uh, Mr. Hu's, Mr. Hu's work, and I didn't really need that for my book. So um, um, I, I had an interview earlier this year with two Chinese reporters, and they didn't say it in, in quite such a direct way, but they meant to say, you're not qualified to write this book. <laughs> you know, you're a stupid guaylo. How can you write this book? <laughs> so uh, I had to, well, I just repeat what I've just said. I mean... Uh, you know, I'm not comparing with these, uh, you know, these very eminent scholars. You know, what I'm writing is nothing compared to them. I'm just trying to make a, a quite a simple, easy to read um, account of his life. And of course, if you want to read more about Hu Shi, you can read his own books, or you can read these excellent uh, scholarly works. Yeah, thank you. Oh, talking about uh, this book, um, I finished reading it, um, and then, yes, it's easy for um, regular readers who's not particularly, well, as long as it's, yeah, they're, they're, they're easy to read. And then I think um, about Mark's books, I think if you, because as I made in the introduction, that he's been written 12 books so far, and then quite a number of them are people also uh, belong to the era that uh, Hu Xi, for example, uh, for example, um, uh, the 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 book about uh, the the wife of Chang Jingguo, uh, the uh, China's Russian princess. I think if you're reading Mark's books together, 
if you read them one by one, instead of just reading one single book, you find it a, a, a series of remarkable books because you've, it gives you an idea what China was like during that period of time. And it gives you multiple perspective about China and then the, the important figures that, is, that played a big part in Chinese history. So I think that is, you know, um, this is a very good introduction, uh, the book made by Mark about Hu Xi, and then his other books. Um, it's a very good introduction for us to, to, for ordinary people, other than, you know, not scholars doing their PhD or writing articles for journals. Uh, academic journals um, to know about these people and, and China during that period of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, this was not planned, this comment. Anyway, please. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. I think it's it's amazing you've you painted you know, this this really amazing person. And if you hadn't written that book, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have known about him at all because I don't study those, you know, philosophy or whatever. Same so thing. thank you very much for <laughs> writing a kindergarten book. But it's it's great. <laughs> thank you. Um, you did say that, you know, he, he had three children. The little girl died of polio. Um, the second son chose to stay in China. What happened to his older son? I mean... Did he get married? Is he in Taiwan? Does he have grandchildren, great-grandchildren? So what's happened to this? So the, the, th this, the first son, he, he, stayed, he started in America. He then went to work in America. He was engineer. He had a very good job in, in, in the United States. Uh, he had one son who, who was a U.S. citizen. He also went to university in America, had a good job. But this son didn't marry. So I, I think the line is, That's it. is is finished now. Yes, I think if you are the son of Hu Shi, you, I think you couldn't, you couldn't go and live in mainland. I don't think. No. <laughs> I mean, Thank if you. Your, your brother had committed suicide. I think you couldn't. He, he was obviously very advanced in thinking. I mean, the the fact that he invited this lady, you know, that that like you say, you know, was into contraception to make all these um, talks in, in, um, you know, in China. That's, you know, that's, I think it's, it's amazing. I mean, he and, really and look what has just happened. You know, Clarence Thomas, the US Supreme Court judge, yes. said now we can outlaw contraception. Did you read that in his, yeah. in his judgment? He said now we can outlaw contraception. Yeah. So here we are. This is 100 years ago. Yes. And I think this is, for this we have to thank Edith Williams. Yes. I think uh, she and Husha had these long talks walking around the lakes of, of Ithaca. Yeah. And uh, I, I think Edith Williams said to, to, to Husha, look, wh what is the situation of women in the world? Yeah. What kind of rights do we have? You know, and at, at that time, uh, contraception was ex extremely controversial, very limited. And uh, uh, I think Husha was profoundly influenced by her. So when he came back, one of the, the first causes he took up was this question of <clears throat> women should be able to choose their own husbands. Women should have sexual equality with men. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, then, and I'm afraid to say today also, men mm -hmm. are more or less allowed to have concubines, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. uh, but women are not. So Husha said, look, it has to be the same. So if, if the man is allowed to have a lover, then the wife should be allowed to have a, a lover too. Okay. And I'm sure you remember the, 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 the play of uh, Henrik Ibsen. Doll's House. <clears throat> this was a very famous play, and Husha saw it in, in New York. And it's about a woman who is, is married, but in the course of the play, she realizes that before she belonged to her father, then she's married to a man, and now she belongs to the husband and then the son. Mm. So she has no liberty at all and no choice. 
So at the end of the play, she, 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 she leaves. She leaves her husband. So when Husha goes back to China, he writes a, very, a play just the same. And in the play, the, the woman has had a husband chosen by her parents. She spends the play trying to persuade them not to, 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 to accept this marriage, mm -hmm. and they refuse. And at the end of the play, she walks out of the house, and then her, her, her chosen man is sitting in a car outside. So this play was extremely popular mm. in China, very influential. And many ladies um, were inspired you know, to, 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 to study and, 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 and to, to pick their own uh, husbands. And uh, I mean, I think this is an enormous uh, contribution to Chinese, well, not just Chinese society, all society. Yeah. Now, of course, many people said, this is OK, what you are advocating, but what is the reality of the society? You know, if a woman divorces her husband, will she find another husband? What jobs are open to women at that time? I mean, I think even in America, the number of professions open to women was quite limited. I mean, China would be even less. Mm. So this would be the argument of, of, of mothers. You know, your ideas are fine, mm. but the reality is that the choice and the freedom of women is quite limited. So therefore, it is safer to, you know, find a husband who's <laughs> a lawyer or works in <laughs> Goldman Sachs, you know. <laughs> okay. You know, let's be realistic. So, yeah. but uh, no, I think uh, whose contribution was great. But we must thank, I think we must thank Edith. Without, her, if he'd not met Edith, I think he would not have this. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Um, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Please. 重要人物都是被日本那邊的思想有影響到的 question is how much is uh, Hushu influenced by language reform of Japan? Yes, sir. Now, Japan is the perfect model for China not only in language, but in all fields. Because Japan started to modernize in 1868. It was also greatly in, behind the industrial countries. And it, it very efficiently and thoroughly began to reform itself. So the Japanese reformers faced exactly the same issue, the Chinese reformers, which is, can we reform our country with Japanese? You know? So some reformers said, let us abandon Japanese altogether. Let us replace Japanese with French or English, which were the languages of the, of the advanced countries at that time. But the reformers decided that's too drastic a step. So what they did was, in 1905, there was a, a language reform commission. And they uh, decided to take the, the language of the educated class of Tokyo as the standard of Japanese. So until today, that is the standard. 1905, it's the language spoken by the educated class of Tokyo. Now, Japanese is easier than Chinese because it has three alphabets. So we have Chinese characters. It also has hiragana, and it has katakana. So with hiragana and katakana, once you learn the alphabet, then you can read the words. So in that sense, it's much easier than Chinese. But of course, the characters, you have to learn, learn, learn the characters. So um, the katakana alphabet is used for foreign words. So I think this is also very logical. So if I'm a Japanese and I'm reading katakana, I know this is not Chinese word or Japanese word. It's a word that comes from, from outside like uh, terebi, 
To Rebbe is television. Or Biru is beer. Computer is computer. <laughs> but in China, of course, China is the center of the world. China is the center of all wisdom. So anything in the world has to be translated, changed into Chinese characters. So China also could have done the same. They could have invented an alphabet for words like telecommunication or computer or aircraft, you know. But of course, this is not possible for, for the Chinese mentality. So the computer is the dianao, you know, the electric brain. So the, the Japanese benefited from starting earlier, having easier language to, 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 to change. And of course, from 1868, Japan trained people to learn German, to learn French, to learn English, to learn all the advanced languages, and then set up, you know, translating institutions to translate medical works, industrial works, technical works from these languages into Japanese. And this is why Japan was able to, 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 to modernize so rapidly. And now China also had this option. But unfortunately in the Qing dynasty, the government was too slow, inefficient, it was divided. So this, this effort was much slower. Now, I, I didn't have time to get on, but uh, Dr. Hu also put enormous efforts into translation of foreign works. Now, it wasn't so much the, you know, industrial or scientific works, more the literary works. So um, he had many uh, projects in this, in this regard. So he, he, was, he, he had the same spirit. So I, I, I would just say it's, it's so tragic that in 20th century, the leaders of Japan and China have never been able to, to have a good relation because they have so much in common and, and they have so much to teach the other. But unfortunately, the, the political relations have always been so bad that um, you know, these benefits have not been, uh, have not been uh, realized. It's, it's a very unfortunate. Okay. I think um, we, are, we have to um, end the uh, book talk now. And then, uh, yes, for, for more detail of Dr. Hu Xi's extraordinary stories, you can buy a copy of the book. Uh, the books are available um, at the counter outside. And then, um, again, thank you all for coming, despite the heat. And then, um, thank you, Mark. I, I will sign the book, and then you can immediately auction it. <laughs> you can make profit immediately without reading it. Okay? Thank you, Mark. Yeah.